everyone, it's Sam here at Model Chili Scale Models, and this is Italeri's 135 scale Crusader 3 from their World of Tanks line. Now this was a British World War II tank, mostly famous for its involvement in the North African campaign. And World of Tanks itself is a hugely popular online multiplayer game featuring tank on tank battles. And the developers Wargaming.net have actually sent me this kit to build and review for the channel. And if you've ever wanted to check out the game yourself and see what it's all about, then you're in luck because they've also sent me a special bonus code for new players, which will be popping up on the screen about now. And it's for the European and North American servers only, but what you'll get is three days of premium account, a Valentine 2 Soviet premium tank, and a free garage slot. So those sound pretty handy. I'll put all the details and the link to where you can redeem the code in the description. And yeah, so if you do end up using the code and playing the game, then do let me know. I'd be interested to find out because I've put hundreds and hundreds of hours into this game. Um, I mostly played it a few years ago, but uh, I went from playing with tanks to building tanks. So that's taken up a lot of my free time lately. So yeah, so uh, as for the kit itself, let's take a look inside the box. All right, so we've got the instruction pamphlet. And painting guide. Now these are based on the camouflage options you can apply in the game. So there you've got desert, winter and summer camouflage. And I will be using one of those. I've always wanted to paint a tank to how it looks in the game, so that'll be quite fun. And then the building instructions. And then there's this little game guide, which gives you just basic information about the game. And then uh, weak spots about the Panzer IV, some historical background, where to shoot it. Um, even if you're playing as the Panzer IV, it's nice to know where your weak spots are so you can avoid getting shot. And the same for the Crusader III. And these two are just two of dozens and dozens of different tanks you can play in the game. Um, there is really quite a large collection of tanks these days. Way, way more than when I first started playing back in... Oh, when was it? 2011, I think, when it launched. And then decal options. And again, these are just markings you can apply to your tanks in the game. So obviously they're not historically accurate. But, um, hmm, the chili looks tempting. And then there's different names you can give your tanks in all different languages. German. Russian and English. And I believe this decal sheet is a, is the same across all the different World of Tanks line, so that's why there's just uh, general marking options for Russian, Allied and German. Although there's no British, French, Japanese, so they are, I think they need to update that a little bit. And then there's general do's and don'ts. And then the kit all in one bag. Now I do believe this is an older Crusader 3 kit, just rebranded with the World of Tanks uh, branding. So if you've ever built an Italeri Crusader, then this will be probably uh, quite familiar. Oh, also, there's a little bottle of glue they've included, so that's quite handy. Right, so let's get building.
Now to glue on these rubber tracks, normal uh, model cement won't work on these, so I'm just using a bit of super glue. Okay, so these are the two antenna pieces that come with the kit, but they're a bit too thick for my liking, so I'm just going to cut these off and make my own. Okay, so just before I apply these little uh, skirts at the side, um, this fender needs to be flush with the rest of the uh, side of the hull, so you can see it's sticking out a little bit there, so I'm just going to sand that back and make it straight. Alright, so that's most of the building complete. And I've left off the wheels for now just to make the side of the hull a bit easier to paint. And then I'll paint the wheels on the track and then attach them right at the end. And so now I'm just going to fill in a few gaps with uh, some Vallejo plastic putty. And with the seams filled, I'm going to apply a primer layer using Tamiya's surface primer, just with a spray can. And this will also help highlight any other gaps or any other bits that need um, cleaning up. So that's the uh, grey primer applied, and now I'm going to do a pre-shading layer just using Vallejo's plain black. Alright, so I've settled on the desert camouflage scheme, even though I'm not that good at doing a camo on tanks. It can be quite tricky getting around all these angled areas, but we'll see how we go. I'm hoping to do this freehand, but I may have to resort to 
a bit of masking to get these shapes. But as for the colours, I've settled on Vallejo Model Air Sand Ivory, uh, 71075 for the base coat, and then for the dark brown uh, Vallejo Model Air IJA Earth Brown, 71136. So now I'm just hand painting the tyres around the wheels with Tamiya's rubber black. Okay, so now it's time to do a bit of camo painting. And I was initially going to do the standard desert camouflage as seen in the instructions. However, over the course of building it, I did remember that there are various different desert camouflage options. You can apply in the game and one of my favorites is the british green spotted version so that just has like a, uh, a light palish green pattern over the tank and then there's dark green spots over the uh, sand colored bits so what i'm going to do for that is vallejo model air just basic green 71104 for the main pattern and then the dark green spots i think i might use this 71022 camouflage green but i'll see how it goes Okay, so now I'm just going to go over it again with the base coat of the sand, just to bring back the green a little bit and give it a faded look. And uh, this is where having a, an airbrush with an adjustable pressure setting really comes in handy because you can get really close to the kit with a low pressure and uh, spray much more defined clean lines. Whereas I don't, um, I've just got a really cheap and nasty airbrush which is locked to 30 psi. So I can only spray from a certain distance without making a mess. So that's why some of these lines are quite blurred. A bit more blurred than I'd like, but that's all I've got to work with, unfortunately. Maybe someday I'll uh, upgrade the airbrush. And now for the dark green spots, I'm going to use uh, this Game Air, Vallejo Game Air Dark Green 72728, which is the darkest green I've got. Okay, so that's all the camo done. Now there's just a few things to paint before I start the weathering, which is just the spare track links. And there's a couple of Pioneer tools. Um, where is it? Spade on the back of the turret. And a couple of tools around here. And I'll just hand paint those. So for the hand tools, there's usually just two components. There's usually a metal part and a handle, which is usually wood. And so you can use pretty much any generic metal and wood color but I'm going for um, my usual 
Vallejo Model A gunmetal, 71072, which is a bit, a bit less of a shiny metallic, um, instead of using like steel or aluminium, which is a bit, could be a bit too reflective. Gunmetal is a nice kind of darker alternative. And then I've just got basic wood colour, 71077. So the next step is to apply a pin wash, although if I was to apply it straight onto the paint it would end up staining and it would be really difficult to remove. So to make that job a bit easier, I coat the entire kit in Tamiya's TS13 Clear and that just leaves a really nice gloss coat so I can apply weathering and modify it and clean it up without affecting the paint underneath. So if you're new to spray cans, especially the Tamiya Clear range, then it's always best to spray on multiple thin coats and wait between each layer because this stuff can really catch up on you quickly if you're not careful. Like for example you'll spray on a layer and think it probably needs a bit more, spray on a bit more and then think oh you have just one more layer to finish it off and then all of a sudden it's way too thick and it started to pull and run in certain areas and you risk ruining the kit which I've done many times before. So it's always best to do one thin layer and then wait a few seconds and then another thin layer and then usually after that I'll just put the kit aside and wait for it to dry. And then if it needs another layer or two then I'll just go back and repeat the process. So here's the gloss coat applied. And I'm just going to start with a bit of Vallejo's model wash light grey. And I'll just start with the wheels. And this colour is just used to bring out a bit of definition on some of this detail. So the wash has been left to dry for a couple of hours and so now I just need to clean up some of these hard lines that you can see and for that I've just got a bit of acrylic thinner on the end of a cotton bud and then I can just wipe away these lines, being careful not to wipe away the wash where I need it. And this is where the, uh, the gloss coat comes in handy because if I was to do this straight on the paint it would start to wipe off all of the camouflage patterns. So because the um, Tamiya Gloss Clear isn't affected by acrylic thinners or water then it serves as a good protective layer. So I'm free to do this with um, the wash. And these pointed cotton buds are really good for getting into tight corners. So if you can find cotton buds like these, then they're, they're well worth it. So now I'm going to put down some decals. And for the naming option, I'm going to either go with Thunderbolt if it fits. And if not, probably Warhawk which will go down the side of the turret there. And I really want to use the British insignia, which isn't included on this decal sheet. So I thought about painting it on myself, but then I was just going through some old decal sheets from old kits, and I found this old F4 Wildcat kit. And so I'm going to cut out a section of these red and white stripes to use for the British um, symbol, which is just a, uh, a white, red and a white box. 
and then I'll stick it to the uh, turret. It doesn't quite fit, it wraps around this corner here, but I don't know, I kind of like it. Um, I think I might just stick with that actually. Now this might not be exactly where these symbols go um, in the game, but um, I do actually have a Crusader on my PC account, but I don't actually have it on the current PC because my gaming PC broke years ago. So I usually play it on the um, Xbox these days. But my Xbox account is still a bit behind and I, I've got a Covenanter, but I don't have a Crusader yet, so I can't actually check um, the tank. Now these decals, especially the name, uh, sit over quite a few of the bolts. So I'm just going to help them settle and thin out just using a bit of Microsol, which is a decal setting solution. And that just thins out the decal and uh, helps to give it that um, painted on appearance. So for the next job, I want to make the paint look a bit faded. So what I'm gonna do is I've got the base coat on a brush and I'm just going to brush it over the corners on the green camouflage just to make it look like that layer has kind of uh, faded and scraped back a bit to reveal the base coat underneath. So I'm just going to dry brush that on, so just remove most of the paint from the brush and then just go over all the raised areas and just gradually build it up. It's a very um, subtle effect and it might not be immediately apparent once you've put it on, but I think it just um, adds to the overall look. Once you start building up the layers, they start to have an effect. And so now for the uh, chipped paint layer, and I'm just going to do the same technique as before, but this time with a, a dark grey. Uh, any dark grey will do. And I'm just going to go over the raised areas as before. Just lay down some random patterns where I think there's going to be chipped paint. And this is just the first layer, so I'll be adding to the top of this. Now the trick is not to keep it, well, to keep it random and not too uniform. Weathering, I find, is by far the most fun part of doing tanks. So sometimes it's hard to know where to, where to stop and not to make it look too weathered. And so with the brush chipping done, I'm just going to do a bit of randomised chipping using the old sponge technique. So I've just cut off a slice of sponge and I've uh, shaped it to a sort of an angled point. Because I want to keep this... Uh, quite minimal, I don't want to go too overboard and I'm just going to soak the sponge in the grey, dark grey paint and then dab most of it off the sponge again just so when I dab the sponge down I get a nice uh, chaotic pattern and so I'm going to concentrate this on the places that are going to get the most chipping so the front surfaces where the but the tank will be driving over terrain and debris and branches and stuff. And also across spaces where the crew was going to be walking and scuffing up the paint.
And then with the most of the paint uh, rubbed off, I'm just going to streak it down the side of the hull just to indicate some sort of uh, travel wear. So with the grey chipping layer down, I'm now going to apply some rust effects using uh, Vallejo model layer German red brown. Any sort of reddish brown will do, just as long as it looks rusty. And again, it's just going to be very subtle. I don't want to go overboard. And just go around all the grey areas that have chipped. So basically the paint is chipped. The uh, metal's been exposed. It's covered in dirt and oil and dust. And then just the edges between the paint and the metal will start to show you a little bit of rusting. And I'm just going to do it in certain areas, just where water is likely to gather and affect the metal. Really how much rust you put on depends on how aged and weathered you want the tank to look. So if you wanted to have the tank look like it's been sitting in a field for years, then you'd obviously apply a lot more rust. But usually tanks that were operational um, in the various theatres weren't really that rusted up, since they uh, had maintenance and repaints. Alright, so for the final layer of chipping, almost done, is to add a bit of gunmetal, so it's just a dark silvery colour, to some of the uh, grey chipped areas. So this is where we've had fresh chipping and the metal is relatively fresh and hasn't had a chance to oxidise or rust. So again, it's just going to be in a few select places, and it just helps to sell the fact that there's... um. A whole load of metal under all this paint. Now I'm just going to do a bit of exhaust staining, just by spraying on black to the uh, back of the exhaust. Now with the wheels I'm just adding a bit of dust and dirt weathering by putting some sand colour into these recessed circles around the edge, just to indicate a bit of accumulation of dust and dirt, and just keeping the old one empty. Keep it random. And because it's still got the gloss coat on it, I can just go back with a cotton bud and clean it up where I've spilled over the edge. So continuing with the sandy dust theme, I've got the same sand colour and I've just thinned it down with acrylic thinner. So it's a really watery texture. And I'm just going to dab it into some of these recessed areas and let the capillary action pull it along. Just get the right amount on the brush. Just to indicate a bit of, um, again, just sand and dust gathering. And if it gets too much, then I can just clean it up.
And now just to finish off, I've just got the same sand colour. And I'm thinned down on a brush. And I'm just going to add in a few rain streaks. Where water has um, caused all the dust in the sand to wash down the side of the tank. But I'm just going to stick this to the turret because there's not a lot of st sloping surfaces on the actual hull. And now for some dust effects, I'm just going to use Vallejo Model Air Sand Yellow, just so it's different to the base coat. And I'm going to spray down the side of the hull, just to uh, dust it up a bit. And I've just temporarily attached the wheels just to do the same effect on those. Alright, so now for the tracks. Um, this one's got a bit of a nick in it, so I'm going to have to position this so that's uh, hidden. But um, as far as the colour goes, these are pretty much the same colour that I usually paint tracks, which is this dark gunmetal colour. So I think I'm just going to leave those as they are to save some paint and I'm just going to apply a wash directly onto this uh, rubbery plastic and to start off with I'm going to apply the Vallejo model wash black And now for a bit of model wash oiled earth. Now for a sand wash. And now I'm going to dry brush on some Vallejo Model Air Steel. Alright, so now it's time to replace the antenna that I chopped off before. And for that I'm going to heat and melt some plastic and then stretch it out to form a nice thin wire. And for that I've just chopped off some spare sprue from the kit. And safety tip, it's always a good idea to clean up your area before you uh, introduce any live flames because you don't want to set fire to any spray cans or anything that's flammable. So everything's been cleaned off and there's nothing that this flame is going to spit onto hopefully. And I've got to cut a few rods here because this usually takes me a few attempts because every time I do this you know, the plastic's always different, the thickness is always a bit different, so it's just trial and error. You've basically just got to get it hot enough to start to melt, but not too close that it just melts instantly. And then just start to feel it getting flexible. And I usually twist it as well before I pull it apart. See, that was too, too much there. This might take me a few goes. Alright, so here we go, finally did it. But I formed this, so I had to pull it up up and beyond the camera and spin it out, so I didn't quite get it on camera, which is always the way. But that should be enough. Now to give them some good attach points to the turret, I'm just going to use my pin vise and very carefully drill out a hole here and over here.
All right, so now I'm finally ready to put on the final sealing coat of Tamiya Flat Clear. And then once that's gone down on everything, then I'll uh, finally put it all together. Also, this kit does come with three figures. Although I could spend another whole video building and painting these guys up, so in the interests of keeping this video under an hour long, I should probably put these aside and then I'll maybe work on them another time. So when threading the track it always pays to double check that you've got it oriented the right way because yes I've put tracks on the wrong way before and in this case the uh, the track link the wide bit is the um, is oriented towards the bottom so that's the bit that hits the road first so it goes um, this way So for these uh, rubber tracks, they don't uh, work with a traditional plastic cement. So you've got three options, I guess. You can either uh, melt them together, which is like a really old-fashioned technique. You can staple them together, which, you know, would leave a huge big ugly staple in there. Or you can just super glue them together. And as you can see, there's a couple of pins at the end that just attaches into a couple of slots on the other side. And assuming you can get those in roughly, then I'll just dab some super glue on the join and then uh, hope it sticks together. Right, so the track has been stuck together, but as you can see, it's kind of just floating above the wheels at the top. Whereas realistically, the weight of the track would push it down to sit on top of the wheels and also create a bit of sag in between each wheel. So to achieve that, what I'm going to do is just brush a little bit of super glue on top of each wheel and then just use some blue tack. And I'll just squeeze it in between the track and the hull just to push the track down and let the super glue set. And I'll just do it in between each gap. All right, so here we have a completed 135 scale Crusade of Three in World of Tanks colours. And yeah, I've certainly had fun building up this kit, mainly the painting and weathering, and I'm pretty happy with how it came out overall. Although I can sit here and think of a few things I would do differently if I was to do this kit again. But I think that's true of all my builds, really. It's always nice to critique your own work and think of things to improve or change the next time you do a tank or another similar build. So. I mean, otherwise it would get pretty boring if every build came out 100% perfect. Well, at least that's what I tell myself. And the video did come out a bit longer than intended. I've already cut out quite a few bits of footage just to keep it under an hour. But uh, hopefully it still has some useful tips and techniques without being too long and boring. But if you have any questions on anything I've missed or didn't cover you know, adequately, then uh, please leave them in the comments below. And I'm always keen to know what you guys think, either of the build or even just the video itself. I'm always thinking of ways to change up the format, so it's good to know what works and what doesn't. And uh, so I better wrap this up. Um, don't forget to follow my Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I'm always putting up regular progress updates, uh, even on um, non-scale related model, non wait, <laughs> non-scale model related things like uh, diecast models or collectibles that I gather now and again. Um, also, my Patreon page has been known to contain the occasional sneak peek of things that are in the works, so be sure to check those out. 
I'll put all the links in the description along with all the information you need to redeem that Word of Tanks bonus code, which, um, again, please let me know if you end up using that. I'd uh, be keen to know. And so I hope you've enjoyed watching the build, and I hope to see you next time. So until then, thanks for watching, and take care.